This is Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Strategies to give your business the inside track. And now, here's your host, Joel Block. Have you noticed tension in the workplace because people just can't get along? Differences between different kinds of people? Well, if you have, put that problem to rest because Rita Craig is going to deal with that for us. Rita, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, so uh, so how do you help people to uh, get along better and uh, kind of put aside their differences? That's that's kind of what you're about, right? That's what I'm about. And unfortunately, I wish I didn't have to talk about this. However, this is the 45th year I've been working in this particular field because, as I always say, there isn't a shortage of people doing inappropriate, stupid things at work. No, there's and- not. No. <laughs> well, let's, so you let's know, start. Let's let's start with this. Let's start sure. with you know, w- without being specific. Uh-huh. Uh, what kinds of things are you talking about? You know, what kinds of things do people do that are uh, just radically bad? There's so much news about people doing bad behavior. What what do you see, and what do you deal with? Well, I see two things. One are things that are against the law, the civil rights law, and some things are just a lack of professionalism. So when you look at things that are against the law, it's inappropriate comments, gestures, emails, and so on related to race, age, sex, national origin, religion, all the different protected groups. And on the other hand, you'll see people making inappropriate comments and just being rude. You know, there's no law that says you have to be, uh, you can't be a rude boss. There are a lot of people who are equal opportunity rude bosses. Not, not against the law, but perhaps against a professionalism policy. The bottom line is both kinds of behavior are toxic. They can become very, very expensive in terms of the attraction and retention of talent. And then obviously sometimes they end up on the front page of the news. And let's, I think let's, that's- uh, so let's address one at a time because okay. they're, they're, they're different, aren't they? I mean, they yeah. uh, require different kinds of actions. So uh, when does behavior become against the law? Well, it depends upon the definition. Let's just take sexual harassment because that's a very topical kind of um, yeah, field yeah. right now. So there's only two types of sexual harassment, quid pro quo, which is this for that. You know, you sleep with me, you're going to get a promotion. Okay. So there's a, a suggestion that- So that's like, a, that's like a bribery that, or blackmail. I mean, that's, that's right, something that falls in that category? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a power issue. So a person uses his or her power in an inappropriate way to get it some kind of sexual favor for business benefit. So okay. again, you know, come back to my room, that compensation you wanted would probably happen. So that kind of thing. Okay. The All other right. one is the hostile work environment. So a hostile work environment is a work environment that is so poisoned with inappropriate comments, gestures, emails, posters, what have you, that a reasonable person would be offended. So you can have a hostile environment based upon sex or race or religion or national origin and other categories. So that's when it becomes inappropriate is when by law, it's, it's clearly a violation. Um, The reasonable person standard is kind Mm -hmm. of a moving target. I I would imagine, Uh, you know, right now we seem to be, uh, you know, everybody's offended about everything all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was at dinner the other night and a a woman was saying that years ago she was uh, asked out by a colleague, uh, you know, on a date and she wasn't offended. You know, she said, yeah, that'd be fine if I could bring my husband along, be no problem. Uh, (laughs) But there are people who would say that was, uh, you know, improper. Uh, I mean, where where is the line and when does it become improper? Because I think that a lot of decent people are starting to be nervous Mm -hmm. uh, Listen, if you're, if you're not doing the right things, you deserve to be punished for that. But if you're a decent person and uh, you're a friendly person, when, when do you cross the line? Well, you know, what you just described, typically a one-time event doesn't constitute sexual harassment. Yeah, that's what if I think somebody too, but... asks you to go out, you go, listen, I'm married, leave me alone. Yeah. But if someone, the person keeps on and on and on, yeah. then you pass that threshold. That's what um, we talked about at dinner too, is if, if they badgered and said, hey, they kept uh, banging on it, you know, the, on the issue, then yeah, that, that would be harassing. But one time it's, you know, hey, listen, sorry, didn't work out and move on. And that's life, right? However, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> one time is so egregious, not asking somebody for a date, but somebody does something that's so egregious and seems out of the ordinary, that one time, that one event could constitute sexual harassment. 
Okay. I mean, listen, I, I guess that, uh, you know, it's all circumstantial. It's all facts and circumstances. It depends what happens. Uh, all right. So, uh, so sometimes it's, uh, it's illegal and it actually uh, breaks the law. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes it just breaks the policy of the company. Describe mm-hmm. a few of those situations. When, when, you know, when, what kind of behaviors are those? Well, what I see a lot of is you'll have a, let's say you have a boss who is just rude and nasty. You know, they yell at people. Well, there's no law that says you can't yell at somebody, but that's a professionalism issue, you know? So that would well, I be- wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't work in that environment. I mean, if somebody was yelling, I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't uh, tolerate it. Yeah, I so. wouldn't either. And you know, one thing you have to remember too, under the Civil Rights Act, it's 15 or more employees. So some of these very small businesses, they don't have protection. Um, I served on the Florida Commission on Human Relations for Florida. And oftentimes, Joel, I get calls from people saying, you know, I've been sexually harassed, or I have a boss who's telling jokes about pregnancy or religion or so on. One of the first questions is how many employees are there? And if it's less than 15, I say, I'm so sorry, there is no coverage. Mm. Wow. Well, um, so what happens? I mean, you know, how does, how does a boss know if the boss is crossing the line and, and what recourse does an employee have when the line is being crossed? Because, you know, listen, I'm all about businesses being successful. I want business to be successful. Uh, in order for business to be successful, uh, the employees that run those businesses need to feel safe and, and comfortable and in order for them to be successful. Because the truth is that the business is nothing without its people who make the wheel spin. Mm-hmm. So how does, how does that happen? I mean, at what point does somebody cross the line? I mean, where, where does somebody go from having a bad personality or, or being in a bad mood all the time mm-hmm. to really being somebody that's doing inappropriate uh, things? Well, typically in a sizable company, there's a reporting system. So, and again, if you have 15 or more employees, you should have a clearly defined policy to bring forth an allegation of inappropriate comments or gestures. It usually will state, tell your boss or human resources or, you know, there's a hotline. Years ago, it used to be just tell your boss, but guess what? The boss boss was the problem. Usually the problem, right. (laughs) So people are going, I'm not going to speak up, you know. And actually, I've taught over 100,000 people. And I always say, why is it you don't speak up and let somebody know? And, you know, Joel, I hear the same thing over and over again. What is it? I'll say things. I don't want to get the person in trouble. I just want it to stop. Um, you know, I don't want to look like a stick in the mud. Yeah. I've seen people speak up in the past and nothing happened. So why should I? And I think that's why this Me Too campaign has a lot of traction. You know, I always look in my research. I think I've, I've told you in the past, every single day I look up five resources just to look at trends and yeah. what's happening, you know, what's going on. And um, I was just kind of surprised the number one word that was researched last year was feminism. And I think that was, of course, attributed to the, the marches and to what was going on in Hollywood, as well as some other pro- high profile cases. So people are talking about it. It's getting a lot of uh, attention. And I, on my side, I do investigations as well as training. And people are taking it a lot more seriously. So I think that's a good thing. I no, think it's a what, good what, thing what because me, if you haven't been trained. Yeah. No, go ahead. What, what, what concerns me about a lot of the Hollywood stuff, and I guess this probably only really applies to high profile people uh, mm-hmm. is that number one, it's very one sided. It's uh, somebody says something and you know, it's yeah. not, it's not a criminal trial. So you're not innocent until proven guilty in the, in the court of public opinion. Uh, it mm-hmm. ends up going haywire crazy uh, fast. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is a lot of these things might've happened when people were much younger, 20 or 30 years old. I should know I'm a lot different. I mean, I, I haven't had these kind of problems. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not a person that does that sort of thing, but uh, but I know that I'm very different than I was 20 or 30 years ago. I'm, I'm just, my, my sensitivities are different. Uh, should people be held accountable for their behavior 20 or 30 years ago, you know, now? Well, here's what I think happened. I, I have a lot of people have asked me this question. And the way I look at it is there's nothing in it for them right now except to affect change. The statute of limitation is already gone. Cr- criminally, now, that's true. Yeah. Exactly. Now, are there people who might come up with a creative story, absolutely. You have that every day in the work environment. However, when you have so many people coming forth and then you start looking at the reputation of the individual and then all of a sudden people start telling stories, then there's a credibility issue and sometimes you have to surmise something did happen. 
So I always tell leaders, err on the conservative side, never give anybody an opportunity to question your values and your judgment. Because quite frankly, you could be the best person in the world. You could be the type of person who would never say any inappropriate things, but somebody can make an allegation against you. Which brings up a whole nother thing because there's so many cases right now where people have been alleged to have done something. Companies have done extensive interviews, found out nothing really happened. Yeah. But you know what? Sometimes people get so angry, they retaliate. And guess what? Retaliation is against the law. So while they never had any problem, other than the fact that a creative employee came up with some kind of allegation that was proven to not have happened, they can't stand it. And they're so angry they get back at the person instead of moving on. So, you know, that's a tough yeah. one. Well, now, so there, there's really a couple different things. So one is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. where you have a smaller company where the boss is the mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. The second kind of situation is where somebody kind of like, uh, you know, where a subordinate has a manager and the manager has more bosses above, above the manager. Mm -hmm. uh, how are the people at the top of the organization supposed to deal with the people who are uh, kind of in the middle if they're accused of wrongdoing? How are boards of directors supposed to deal with, with people? How are, uh, how are senior executives supposed to deal with people to protect mm -hmm. their company and to protect themselves they, they want to look like they're doing all the right things, then they do want to do all the right things. So what are those? So a couple of things. One is you have to have an affirmative defense. So in other words, you have to have a clearly defined policy that strictly prohibits harassment and discrimination in the workplace. In the first place. So first, so yes. first things first, you have to have a policy. Now, you're not an attorney, right? No, I'm not an attorney. Okay, so we're just talking about common sense, not, not common law. Common sense practical things you're supposed to do. Okay, so good. you should have a clearly defined policy that's communicated throughout the organization. You should have training for all employees so that they understand what is and what is not acceptable uh, in the workplace. Because again, a lot of people don't have any training in this field. They're watching TV. They're listening to people say inappropriate things all day long in their workplace on TV, and it's okay for them. Right. So, I always ask that when I train, why is it that they can say it and you can't? And most people say, well, First Amendment. And um, you know, my, my comeback is, don't you have First Amendment? The difference is you, you don't have to watch that TV station. But in the work yeah, environment, cool. you know, you're not supposed to walk down the hall going like this, right? You're supposed to work in an environment free from all forms of discrimination. So, so clearly defined policy, training on an annual basis, send out a notice, restating your longstanding commitment to a positive work environment. Make sure that you have a culture where people feel they can speak up, you know, um, because there's yeah. so many differences at the work environment today. We, we're all a work in progress, but here's the reality, Joel. Every single one of us, sometime in our life, has said or son done something we wish he could take back. Yeah. You know, it's like a tube of toothpaste, you know, you squeeze it, goes out there. That's it, you can't that's it. Back in. So yeah. it's a work in progress and we have to learn and we, we have to say I'm sorry and, and listen, and every one of us has been on the receiving end of that too, by the way, you know, where, uh, you know, where we've had to either, you know, forgive someone or not uh, based on, you know, what it was. Yes. So, uh, you know, but we just, we just live in a world where people get benefit from being wronged. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's kind of the problem is that we need to kind of uh, move past some things, but mm -hmm. there are some things that you can't move past. There's some things that really are bad and that they need to go mm -hmm. away. We need to stop doing those things. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of what we're talking about, really. I, I hope we're talking about things that are really genuinely bad things that should really go away and not just mm -hmm. personal preference. Uh, yeah. You know, I wish the guy would lower his voice a little bit. And you know what I'm saying? I mean... Again, that goes back to the difference between, you know, illegal and legal. You know, right. you yes. know so it could be a policy thing. It's a professionalism, yeah. uh, not necessarily something against the law. Well, you know, and what we're talking about is, you know, people's ability to earn a livelihood. In the United States, everybody has to earn a livelihood to take care of their families. That's why these issues are so important. If you're sitting on an airplane next to somebody who's spouting off a bunch of things that you don't like to hear, uh, it's, it's a much different story that, you know, you don't really have a, uh, uh, that kind of an environment because uh, there's, there's the, the rights are different because you're not in, a, in an employment environment, right? So uh, what if you just encounter somebody that just is uh, kind of spouting off on an airplane or in a public place? You know, at what point, here, here's, here's the kind of the question. At yeah. what point does a person speak up and say, hey, you know what, that, that doesn't work for me. I don't like that kind of behavior. Should we be doing that? I think, I think
think it's appropriate. You know, I, I happen, actually I had that happen going to the Super Bowl, not this year, but several years ago. And a couple of guys behind us were, you know, using really, really foul language. And by the time the game started, they were royally drunk, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. And I went and told, you know, I spoke up and I told the guard and they kind of watched them and then they did it again. Then they poured a Coke on, uh, on somebody sitting in front of them and they were ejected. Well, so I think, oh, yeah, but yeah. is it, I think, I think the question is sometimes you feel like you're in the position to speak up. Sometimes you use the process. Like I told the guard, Yeah. you know, I yeah. felt like, you know, well, listen, I, because it could be a dangerous situation for you. Absolutely. You don't know the people, uh, they, they're the big yeah. men uh, that had had some alcohol. Who, who knows what their tempers are? You don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, you don't know. But what if, what if you were at dinner with a, a group of friends and mm -hmm. somebody was making jokes that were just uh, out, of, out of color. They're, they just were improper kinds of jokes. Would you say something? Yes, and I'll tell you why. You tolerate what you believe. And I think, you know, if people turn it off and on, you don't have consistency, and consistency builds trust. So when you look at leaders, le leaders are on 24-7, you know, and there are many cases of people choose to do inappropriate things off, off hours, but they're really never off hours that yeah. have come back into the work environment. So let's say you're in this booth and you're telling inappropriate jokes or your friends are and you're all laughing and having a good time. Little did you know there was another employee on the next booth who Monday morning came and said, I don't think I can work with my boss anymore. This is what he or she said. It becomes a company's position to take yeah. action. Yeah. So, so, so really all of us are kind of on all the time is what you're saying. Yeah, and, and here's, you know, here's what I hear people say. I never want to be in management. I don't want to be a leader. So my question then is, are you telling me you need to tell inappropriate comments and jokes and look at dirty email messages? Because that's what you're saying. You don't want to no. overreact. You don't my, want to my, overreact. My attorney, you know, my attorney cautions. <laughs> uh, we, we do a conference a couple times a year, my attorney and I. And one of the things that he talks about is that people have phones and cameras everywhere you go. You always have to assume people have a phone or a camera that's pointed at you or some uh, mm -hmm. in some way. And mm -hmm. everything that you say uh, could be recorded, uh, could be mm -hmm. tweeted, could be uh, you know put on Facebook. And if you're making jokes, uh, it could be taken out of context. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you know. I think all of us just have to learn uh, to be more sensitive uh, mm -hmm. to our environment. And and really, uh, jokes that hurt other people's feelings are really not okay. I mean, things that we did when we were in elementary school because we didn't know any better mm -hmm. are not okay as adults. Yeah. And, and you know, the bottom line is people's feelings get hurt. Mm -hmm. And we have to be sensitive to other people's feelings. And that, uh, that may sound a little soft, but that's mm -hmm. kind of how the world is. And, you know, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be the worst thing for us to have a soft world. And that doesn't make us weak. Yep. It makes us nice. And nice is a good thing. So uh, I, th I think if we're a little sensitive to other people's feelings, that's probably a good thing. So let's come back to the, to the business side. And, let let and me add I, one thing to that. Go ahead, go ahead. Not only being sensitive to other people's feelings, I think it's being protective about your reputation. Yeah. Okay. So oh, that, I think that's a different I, I like, I choose to do, bring that angle in there because it's really about your brand and do you want to compromise your brand? Do you again, want to give somebody the opportunity to say, Oh yes, that's, that's how that person is. You want to protect it. No matter mm -hmm. who's around, you want to protect it. So one, one, there's an altruistic reason and there's also a selfish reason mm -hmm. that, that we all need to keep care of ourselves is that, you know, number one, it's, it's not nice, but number two is that, uh, you don't want to be branded as somebody that is, uh, you know, just an idiot, that just does things that are just uh, generally discourteous and hurtful to other people. That that's a bad thing because that carries on into your company and, and everywhere else. So uh, I, I think that's excellent. So let's come back. Okay. How disruptive to a company? When I talk about disruption, I'm usually talking about technology and things. But mm -hmm. I totally get that a nice little company that's humming along, uh, making money, doing great, can be totally knocked off the tracks. Uh, by this kind of thing. Have you seen companies be totally turned upside down and can they ever get righted again once that happens? Yes, and yes. So okay. I have seen companies who have been stellar companies, hung the banners in the parade, you know, very good community citizen, only to have it unfold that they've allowed inappropriate, you know, behavior to happen. You, sometimes it's, you know, a disgruntled employee, sometimes Somebody's just had it. Somebody had a neighbor who brings the sport to the newspaper or whoever it is. So, so who likes that? Their competitors because their competitors are right there to take their sure. clients over. Sure. Um, it's going to cost them a boatload of money. 
Uh, you don't think you have time to do preventative measures, but guess what? You have all the time in the world to fix it because you have to fix it. And you're going to spend your money on one end or the other, so why not spend it, uh, spend it on uh, prevention? Now, have I seen it turn around? Absolutely. I can think of several companies that um, had bad practices, had national news, yeah. only to say, you know what? We're going to turn this around. We are going to be known as a diverse, a diversity and inclusive uh, organization, and then gone on to win a lot of awards. So you asked a question a little while ago about executives. Here's what I see, unfortunately. They'll say, yes, we should have training. Tell everybody to go. They don't go because they don't feel they need it or it's not at their level. But the best practicing companies, the CEO and president, is not only in the training first, but they're kicking off all the programs. So, so how the often they are modeling the right way? How often do you see uh, a company say, "Okay, we'll take the training," where they just listen, read it, come on in, do the training. We want to check the box. We're going to pay the least we can. We're going to move you in and out as fast as we can. Check the box and throw you out and be done and, and, and say we did it. Or how often do you see companies that really embrace this and say, "You know what? We we really recognize that this was a bad idea." Uh, we're going to be a better company mm -hmm. by helping people to get along better and be more respectful. How often does that happen? Does it ever really happen? I'd say the latter is, is more true. Um, first of all, when I'm called in, I have a conversation with the executives, usually the president or chairman, about how serious they are about it and what is the legitimate business reason for this. Yeah. Why are they doing this? And I always say there's two things. One, there is a business reason for it, but two, it's the right thing to do. So I have to found, have the foundation that they have a strong commitment because if not, I'm wasting my time. So, like but, but, but the question time. is, how often do they have that strong commitment or they just want to check the box and say they did it? I would say more and more it's, it's, it's wanting to do the right thing because they see the implications. They see the implications it has on the employees, their ability to attract and retain talent. Uh, their brand and the impact on their brand, as well as their customers. You know, I think we've all seen, you know, on, an, on the national scene, companies pull away from sponsoring events just because somebody's done something wrong. Boy, um, sponsors are really sensitive to these things. And that's, oh. that's really the barometer. Yeah, I was reading a report today how more and more, you know, with athletes, I know you like baseball, and I'm, I venture to say sooner or later, you're going to see more sports people take on social social activities because that's what people do today you know, you have the millennials and the gen behind them are very socially conscious um, they want to know that companies are doing the right thing it's not uncommon to look on a website and see social responsibility as part of the company's you know um, brand and what yep. they're they're telling people about you know and, and surveys show millennials rather work for a company that has a social consciousness than to make a lot more money I want to know that there's a give back there. So, you yeah. know, when you take a look at that and, and you just can't afford to be in business today and survive some kind of negative, um, you know, comments or gestures. It's just a tough thing to do. And again, yeah. it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. I just, uh, I just go back to the, uh, to the issue. I wonder how many of these uh, companies are doing these things because lawyers tell the CEO that they have to, which mm -hmm. basically becomes a check the box situation. Or how many times it's happening because they really feel like it's the right thing to do. And so let's let's end and just say that uh, hopefully uh, it's coming from the heart and it's not coming from lawyers. And and you know and that's it. But I'm sure you do good work and, and the work that you're doing is critical work. So thanks for sharing and let's hope that companies uh, have less disruption because they're doing the right thing. I would hope so. Thanks, right. Joel. Thanks, Rita. You've been listening to Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Strategies to give your business the inside track. For more strategies and to learn more, visit joelblock.com. <laughs>